Well, let me give you a little overview of our plan for tonight. And um, we'll see if Who's anybody the, else hops on. Who's the lady with the glasses? This is Naomi. Hi, Hi Naomi. I don't Hi. know. Hi. Well, Naomi's the one, Diane, Naomi's the one who did that fabulous patterns, the unusual patterns. That like shape like a bird? That the color, are you talking about the color ones? Oh, yeah, she did the color value scandals. I, I, I have, now I know who Naomi is. Thank you, Judith. <laughs> And that's what's fun is once we, you know, the more we see each other, you'll recognize each other's names on the website. And Diane, you've been chatting with Naomi this whole time. You just didn't even know it. I did not. I did, I did <laughs> last week, I guess. Yeah, no, oh. fun stuff. Here we go. Rain, rain. Oh. Oh. Well, so tonight we're going to be talking all about the art element space. Um, before we jump in, I'd love to hear if y'all have any uh, thoughts or comments on how the past week or a couple of weeks has been going. Um, I'll have a quick presentation for you guys on space. We'll overview the week's homework and then we are going to be drawing using negative space together. And then at the end of tonight's call, I got a big announcement that I'm super excited about, uh, which I'd love your help um, giving me some ideas for. And that's going to be our call. So tell me about your experience this week. How did your drawings feel? So I enjoyed doing the homework. I kept saying, you know, I'm, I'm in my head a lot. No <laughs> surprise. I kept saying, how am I going to use this? How, how, I want to see how I'm going to use this in my drawing. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And then the other thing is that while I was doing the drawing, I kept seeing all the... Um, posts from the urban sketches uh, and San Miguel oh. and how loose everything they do is. And at some point I want some help with that. Awesome. Well, and that is something that we had talked about as um, a future possible theme yes. for a month, yes. which I think would be a lot of fun. But not until I come back. But not until you come back, no, so no, at least no, not no. until October. We just got oh. so much... So much to cover. Well, you said the next one after I come back was going to be buildings. Right. I so want to do buildings in October. Gosh, so much to learn. Ooh. How Ooh. about Somebody you, Diane? Said, Somebody, when I can get to it, I, you know, the time just goes away, the half an hour, who knows half an hour. <laughs> That's been my biggest surprise, is that I thought, oh, the elements, they'll take 10 minutes, I'll be done. And it's taken me longer than when we did portraiture. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> so. I don't even set a clock. I assume it'll, I'll be done when I'm done. Yeah, that's luxurious. <laughs> oh, I set, needless to say, I set the clock. Right. <laughs> I'm the yin and yang, friends. So let's, first of all, learn all about the art element Space. We're going to be talking um, about the many different types of space. And I have to say, this is probably my favorite element of art. Uh, you'll see why. So there are many different types of space. We're going to be talking about um, a few of them. One is positive and negative space. So just remember that phrase from now. I'll show you some real examples of it in a moment so you can get some visual connections. There's the illusion of depth, so things seeming to be farther away. And as we've mentioned in the past, the elements of art are almost always working in um, symphony with each other. So we spoke a lot last week about that third dimension form and how to create that depth using shading and, um, and form. We're going to talk about how that also relates to creating the illusion of, of space. So there can be... Um, the depth of perspective. So here on the right, you see just an image of a mountain far, far into the distance. So when we're thinking of space, we're also thinking about the space, the empty air between you and something that is far, far away from you. Um, there's also atmospheric perspective. So with atmospheric perspective, uh, we see the actual illusion of things appearing to be fuzzier and a different color the farther away they get from us. Um, we're going to see a lot more about that. And as I mentioned, the form of depth. So, so that, that third dimension that we talked about last week also falls a little bit under a type of space. 
And then there is the space whenever you're composing your drawing and or your, your full picture. So that would be, um, for example, if you decided to leave a lot of empty air in, for example, if this was a painting of a mountain, uh, then that would be considered space. So let's see some more examples. So here, oh gosh, sorry. I was hoping to um, move. I don't know if y'all can see that little second goose. Uh, but this is a painting from Maruyama Okyo from the 18th century called Geese Over Beach. And in this one, you can see just the incredible amount of empty space and how powerful it can be to actually leave sometimes the majority of your um, composition empty or almost empty. There are some just feather light waves that are showing in this image. So next, this is one of my favorite artists, Andy Goldsworthy, and he is known for his um, built, built sculptures using natural materials out in nature. Um, and here he has constructed sticks that are coming out of the, out of the water um, in a circular pattern. Now, the way that he's composed this and, and taking his photograph, uh, of course we see the negative space of the empty sort of hole in the middle of this image. Something extra incredible about it to me is that it is the mirror of the, the water that is creating that full circle effect. Imagine just wandering on a hike and, and you know, happening upon something like this would be so magical. Um, so here's a wonderful example of negative space. Another Andy Goldsworthy. This is made using leaves. So he's found just natural leaves in the environment and has um, put them together to also combine interesting use of value. So we're seeing the values go from a high bright yellow, darker and darker orange to black. Of course, color um, being used really beautifully here. And then the space, like we're zooming in on a big empty nothing, and yet it's a powerful empty nothing. Love that. Now here, this is Gustave Colbert, uh, not Colbert, uh, Calibo. Gosh, my French. Uh, this is one of my favorite paintings. And here we're seeing a use of linear perspective. And if you look at the... Um, boards, thank you Judith, the wooden boards on, on the ground, you can see that they are all receding um, toward what would be a vanishing point if we were to get a ruler out and follow each of those lines back to a single point. They would all be radiating out from a point. We're not going to go super in depth or even a little bit in depth into linear perspective today, but I just want you all to be aware that um, as things go back into the distance, they appear smaller. And if we use sort of a mathematical frame over it, um, the way that we see things going back into depth, there's actually a way you can map that using lines that all appear to converge at a vanishing point. So here you can see how the boards have been stripped by these um, floor scrapers. Uh, those lead our eye back to what that vanishing point would be. And it's also just masterfully done with the way that the light hits the boards and then we can see the texture of the shiny oiled wood um, and then the bare wood where they're scraping it. One of my favorite pieces. This is another piece by Gustave Calibo. Um, this is around the right before the turn of the 19th century. I know it's a masterpiece. It's called Paris Street Rainy Day and here there are two different types of perspective that I'd like us to check out. So first of all, we have linear perspective again. And the linear perspective is seen more than anything on the building that is sort of a triangle. You can see the two streets going off in either direction in the background behind the, the over the shoulder of the couple. Um, so if you were to walk down both of those streets, you know that each of them would lead off into different directions, different points. So this is a two-point perspective drawing. The last one we looked at was one-point perspective, but um, you can have multiple perspectives in an image, as you can see, as the two sides of the building go farther away from us, go back into depth, they appear to be smaller. Um, 
the edges and the lines all the way from the rooftop to the uh, sidewalk would converge if you were to take rulers and, and follow them back to those two points. So that's an example of linear perspective, two point, but it's also a nice example of atmospheric perspective. And of course the atmosphere is uh, heightened on this day because as we can tell, it's a rainy day. Um, <clears throat> so atmosp atmospheric perspective comes from water vapor in the air, creating an illusion of haziness in the distance. So things that are very crisp and clear close up. So for example, the couple, we can see their faces very clearly, very crisply. If you look closely, you can even see this woman has a beautiful pearl earring and lace um, detail over her face. Ugh, so gorgeous. But if you look far, far away into the, the distance where the edges of those buildings terminate, you see things are very hazy. So they're higher in value. If you imagine those water vapors in the air, um, they're blocking our view. They're making it less detailed. Another thing that happens is things that are farther away appear cooler in color. And things that are closer to us appear warmer um, in their color. So this is very subtle in a painting like this, but the artist, I'm, the more I'm looking, I'm seeing some um, little things that he's done that uh, emphasize this. So in the cobblestones on the street that are closest to us, we see some pinks and oranges, some of these warm tones. Even the building behind the couple um, has a red facing wall and their faces are very warm. This is all going to give us the sense of these um, being close to us. And this is all in the artist's foreground. So you have the foreground, the midground, and the background. Here in the midground, we've got some people walking, a big empty plaza, and in the background, uh, uh, where the building is, that's going farther in, into the distance, um, things are hazier and cooler. We see sort of a bluish, um, grayish sort of haze where the, the buildings um, end. So less detailed, cooler colors, and higher in value, hazier and fuzzier. All of these are part of atmospheric perspective. We see a little bit more of that here. This is from Brugel the Elder. This is a painting called Hunters in the Snow. And one thing um, you can notice again is we see that atmospheric perspective not used quite as um, distinctly as with uh, Gustave Calibo in the last painting. These two paintings also have several hundred years in between them. So we learn as we <laughs> evolve as a civilization and artistic, you know, collective mind. Um, but we still see things are hazier, smaller, uh, and just less clear in the distance. Whereas things that are closer to us appear warmer. We see warmer colors being used. In the foreground, we have the hunters and their dogs um, coming up over the hill. And one thing I'd also like to point out that creates an, a sense of space is overlapping. So this is something subtle. It's something you probably see so often you wouldn't even think of it. But sometimes whenever we're thinking about how we space um, different subjects, different items in our painting, um, you might feel like, oh, well, I would hate to chop off that dog's head by overlapping the tree in front of it. But in fact, that's going to create a more realistic sense of space that um, these things are taking up three-dimensional space uh, realistically um, by overlapping them. So overlapping is a strong choice in certain situations. Um, so there's another good one to know. This is probably a familiar face, Uncle Sam. And there are a couple uh, uses of space that I like here. First of all, we have the empty area around Uncle Sam. Notice that it's not all busy, busy, busy. It's really trying to make a statement. And one thing that helps is the absence of too much busyness. So white space can be really important. Um, another use of space here is the extreme angle, which we call foreshortening of that finger being pointed right at us. So you can look at your hands and you know, left side of your brain, that um, your fingers are long, that they should take up, you know, a 
kind of rectilinear sort of uh, form. But whenever something is coming right at you, we see it in such a way to where that finger no longer looks like a rectangular prism sort of form. Now it looks almost circular and we just see the tip and it's, it's very strange. If you've ever, if you haven't tried foreshortening before, it will whew, turn you, turn your mind for a doozy. Um, but this is an example of uh, extreme linear perspective. Here is another example. Uh, this is from, let me make sure I'm giving you the right one. Um, Shepherd boy pointing to Tobias and the angel. This is from uh, the 1500s, around the Renaissance times, by Abraham Blomer. And we see a lot of different uh, techniques that create space happening here. So first of all, overlapping. It's uh, subtle, or you know, it's not something that necessarily you think, oh yes, the overlapping in this painting. <laughs> but the still life in front of uh, the shepherd boy, we see all jumbled together, this brass pot, the bucket, the paddle, all in front of the boy, and it creates a realistic area. We know he's sitting here um, having some kind of afternoon moment, and of course there's the atmospheric perspective in the background. We see that mountain far in the distance appears uh, very light or kind of hazy, um, it's getting stormy in the background back there. Things are very detailed, close up in the foreground. In the midground, we have the angel and Tobias. <laughs> uh, I'm not personally familiar with this Bible story, but um, of course it would have been illustrating to uh, typically back then what was generally a non-literate society, one of the important stories from the Bible. Um, and then of course the far background where we see the landscape. Also a wonderful use of just the empty space of the sky, really subtle, uh, kind of just a nice neutral color area that lets the eye rest so that whenever we circle back around to see all the detail bits of the story, we can check those out. I would even say here that we've got a wonderful use of three-dimensional form, especially in that brass pot. Talk about some good looking texture. We see the reflected light. If you look down at the bottom of the brass, of course, it's also a ref reflective object, but you can see the green of the grass, um, that core shadow in the middle of the brass object, the highlight, all of that creating uh, another illusion of depth and space by having a beautiful representation of form. Moving right along. Um, so this is... I want to make sure I'm giving y'all proper um, details. Uh, I believe this one is called, I don't, I guess I didn't write it down. Um, Christina's, it's by Andrew Wyeth. It's like Christina's something. Hold on, I'll pop you up. Uh, I can tell. Diana. Christina's world. Thank you, Christina's world. <laughs> oh, goodness. In I gotta... Delaware somewhere. Brush up on my art history, thank you. Um, beautiful epic piece and speaks to Christina's internal world as well as her external world. We could spend a long time going into the psychology behind this, this beautiful piece. Um, and one thing that creates to me a sense of loneliness and isolation for this woman is the, the vast sense of space between her and the home far off in the distance. Um, one thing that you'll notice is depending on where you place the horizon line, it can make things seem either very immediate if the horizon line is low down to the ground, we're all kind of on the same floor. But if that horizon line is way up high, it's, um, it creates another illusion of space. Here we have, it's not empty or negative space, um, but the grass texture between her and the home far in the distance uh, still, again, gives that eye room to breathe. It's not full and busy of other objects. So um, beautiful piece that is a wonderful example of space here. This is Caspar David Friedrich's Monk by the Sea. And one thing about some of his work is that it's uh, realistic, but 
if you were walking through a contemporary art gallery, I could almost see this, you know, and think it could be a Rothko or something. You've got uh, so much empty space and such a tiny little person in this landscape that you could almost miss the person and just see it as these geometric shapes and colors. So we've got the enormous vastness of the sky um, and then the tiny little horizon line down below. You can see again how the horizon line changes the sense of space. Um, so very interesting use of almost empty areas of the um, canvas to create the composition here. And I would say it gives that sense of the enormity of nature versus how small man is compared to the sea, the sky, these huge forces um, that we have in nature. So just a little bit of some art historical background on how we can see uh, space used before we look at some of the easier ways that we can create it. Um, so here you see what we've been discussing. You can create an illusion of space by number one, overlapping. And here we're just looking at this super simple little um, balls sort of shapes that are uh, giving us an example of these guys. So overlapping one item in front of the other. Shading, creating that three-dimensional form. So number two, we see that it's not just a circle anymore, it's a sphere. That, that is included in um, one way to create the illusion of space. Placement, so that's, that's thinking about composition, just as we've seen in a lot of these different famous paintings, the way that you decide to put the objects on your, whatever, your, whatever it is that you're drawing. Um, it can change almost the psychology of how we feel and how we associate how, whenever the viewer looks at that object. So when things are randomly placed, it might feel a little chaotic. If things are grouped together, um, perhaps it would give a sense of, uh, of things being uncomfortably squished or if things are evenly spaced, it can be more unified looking. So we can create a lot of different feelings and effects for the viewer depending on the placement of objects and how much empty space we do leave behind. We look at number four, size. We can create an illusion of space by having some things so close to us that they are literally um, coming off of the page. You can break the frame of your, of your page this is something that's interesting. I, I notice a lot of beginning artists do this. I've done it myself. When you're drawing something, maybe it's a person or a building, and you realize as you're drawing, oh my gosh, this isn't going to fit on the page. But instead of letting go off the page, we just squish the edge of the thing that we're drawing and try to get it all on there, which inevitably just doesn't look right. So you officially have permission given by your art teacher, Jessica, you are allowed to just let that thing go off the page, let the lines just um, not even show where they, they end. So that can be, in fact, a really cool way of um, showing uh, in, impressive, big, huge things. So that's gonna be in your homework, you'll be doing a little bit of that. And of course, and also number four, you, you see that as things get farther away, they have the illusion of getting smaller. And I have to say they have the illusion of getting smaller because we all know when we get on an airplane and take off, we're not actually getting smaller in our airplanes. But if you were a little kid watching the airplane take off, of course, it looks like it gets teeny, teeny, tiny. Number five, value and focus. This leads right back into atmospheric perspective, which we were uh, looking at a little earlier. So as things get farther away, they are also going to appear to be lighter in value. They'll be darker and crisper and more detailed whenever they're closer to us. And that when this speaks of focus, it's that hazy quality. We might see things appear to be blurrier the farther away they are from us um, and crisper and clearer the closer they are. So important things to remember. And then of course, linear perspective and I don't know if y'all can see, um, let me just make sure this is over here. There we go. If you look on the uh, number six panel here, you'll see that there is a teeny tiny dot on the horizon line or the line that separates the sky from the earth on that image and that the top and the bottom of these spheres are sitting in alignment with um, 
two converging lines that converge on that uh, horizon line. That's called our vanishing point. That was the quickest, dirtiest linear perspective lesson <laughs> I think I've ever given. But those are the absolute basics. And hopefully, y'all are visual people like me. You can see how that works, basically. And nothing in your homework is going to ask you to do any more advanced perspective than that. Okay, negative space. So oh, I think this is just one of the coolest things. Um, you might consider negative space to be sort of like a silhouette. And if you can't quite recognize this object, it's a, a close-up. I think could have fit it on the page better, but um, it is a close-up of a pot with a plant in it. And what we've done is it's almost like um, if there was a photograph of this plant, we've cut out the image of the plant itself, what's called the positive space. Everywhere where the plant would normally be, where we would normally take the time to draw the textures of the leaves and the ceramic base and whatever, completely taken that out and darkened the background or the negative space, the area around um, the plant itself, and put it into high contrast. You can see that again here, this time with hands this is a uh, more of a graphic image and with positive and negative space you see a lot of these really kind of interesting mind trick sort of images uh where the black and white play off of each other of course here we have the mirror image of the hands um and negative space whenever we're looking at it it's all about the area around the object and so when I'm drawing hands, or really anything, um, this is one of the most powerful things that helps me get things in perspective, and, or in proportion, excuse me. So, especially something that's complicated, like a hand. If I am focused too much on looking at the positive space thing itself, the uh, complications and the, uh, all the little details of the hand, I can lose the big picture of the relationship between, for example, a thumb and an index finger. But if I'm only looking at the negative space, I'm ignoring the fingers themselves, but I'm saying, okay, well, how much higher up is that index finger? Uh, is, it a, is the space in between them sort of at this angle or that angle? Sometimes if I look at the space, I'll say, gosh, you know, the area between those two fingers almost looks like a curvy triangle. If I get that curvy triangle incorrectly, then boom, the fingers are automatically proportionally in the right spot. So this is one that I think you're going to get a lot out of, but as usual, we'll um, learn better by doing when we practice this drawing ourselves in a little bit. So let me go ahead and stop just to get y'all's feedback. Any um, thoughts or favorites from our oh, so many favorites discussion. so many favorites yeah. but the um, the atmospheric colors of the monk were just mm. beyond who did the monk please that is Kaspar David Frederick Frederick Thank you're supposed to say his name with an accent Mm -hmm. And he's got some incredible paintings, very man versus nature is, is an ongoing theme in his work. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me, I do want to pop up my screen once more to share one other item. And then we're going to dive into looking at our homework for the week. Ooh. But you just reminded me, um, color again, plays a lot into atmospheric perspective. So here's just a few more simplified versions of that. We spoke about the value getting higher and higher. You could also think of that as saturation. Um, the farther away an object is, it appears to get lighter, but in color, that just means a less saturated version. We've seen something similar to that. Color temperatures, we talked about warm and cool. And I, yeah. And this you're going to see exactly in your homework. So this is all some cool, um, cool visuals for you of the atmospheric perspective. All right, let's dive into the homework and 
just say a little something if you've got um, any questions as we go through this. So here we go, week number three already. So, wow. for, <laughs> yes. So for day number one, this is all about just pure negative space. And this is what we're going to be drawing together after we finish our um, overview of our week's homework here. So if you look at the first example, even though we haven't drawn the object, we've drawn everything except for the object around the object, you know what that object is. It's a coffee cup. So that is your challenge. Yes, Judith? So do you actually draw the coffee cup and then darken around it? That's what I do. I begin by drawing the silhouette, basically. Yeah. So you'll remember uh, contour drawing from uh, our past lessons. Contour is when you really focus on the, uh, you could essentially say is the outline of the subject that you're looking, looking at, almost as if you were reaching out and touching the part of the image, uh, the subject that you're drawing that is um, touching the area around it. So that, that line between where the thing is and where it isn't, the positive space of where the object is and then the negative space of all of the air or background behind what it is that you're drawing. So we see that with the coffee cup, we see that with the chair. Um, on the right, you see a couple of potted plants. So I would actually recommend, I would love if you could find your own examples of negative space images to draw, or um, what we're gonna be drawing, what I'm gonna be drawing today. Oh, question. Coffee cup, yes, Naomi. Is it valid to just shade your whole area and just draw, kind of draw with your taking off. I love Great that. Idea. Yeah, I love <laughs> that is called subtractive drawing. So it's mm -hmm. a very official <laughs> thing. It has a name. Thank You're you. welcome to do that. Yeah, um, I would cool. recommend if you if you do try that, um, maybe just try at least one the other way around I guess either way as long as you're drawing with your pencil you're still okay. thinking about that okay. that line that's the interface between the two but there's something about negative space I've, I've had people tell me that it almost um, gives them that feeling of if you've ever done one of those magic eye illusions yeah, yeah, yeah. it is possible yeah those books that you hold them close up to your face oh, yeah. and then, yeah they, they appear to have a three-dimensional so thing. Mm -hmm. So it is something that our eyes are not used to doing. It's something that our eyes often feel uncomfortable doing at first. So if that happens when you first start working with negative space, just say, this is normal, <laughs> no big deal. Um, you are actually that discomfort. Some people even get a little bit of a headache. That is proof that your brain is making new connections and you're starting to see the world in a different way. And really you are rewiring your brain by going through this art challenge because it will make you see the world differently and definitely improve your drawing. Day number two, we are having another take on the positive negative space um, conversation. So for this one, it might be easier to copy straight from these examples or you're welcome to look. I'll be posting again a Pinterest page. It's going to have even more examples for you to see um, these. Basically, what it, the idea is is you're taking one image and either sort of um, mirroring it. So, for example, with the cats, you've got a negative space cat mirrored by the positive space cat. Uh, or with the butterfly, you're taking that object and sort of cutting it in half and then allowing the positive and negative spaces um, to reflect each other on the opposite. So it's really just pushing you to practice um, seeing things in these opposite terms. So positive, negative vision. And the farther one, what really this is, is we've got these four sort of flower shapes and a square placed on top of them. Everything in this sort of white diamond square that's cutting the flowers in half flips the con <clears throat> contrast. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. Day number three, this is when you get to create your atmos atmospheric perspective mountain range. If you have another um, subject that you'd like to draw instead of a mountain range, you're welcome to, but um, I think this works really well. You can decide if you want to do only a pencil version or if you'd like to jazz it up perhaps with pen and using pen and wash or markers or colored pencils. So either of these two examples would work. Um, the key is that in the foreground, we'll have the darkest dark. You can just almost imagine this as a sort of value scale assignment using really organic lines to create the sometimes soft, sometimes jagged ridges of the mountains. In the middle ground, you'll have a couple of mountains that are in those middle phases of your value scale. And in the far distance, you're going to have really soft um, edges. You might not have a sharp line, but almost like a fuzzy line where the mountain meets the sky and a much higher value. So very light, light, light um, images. So I hope you guys have some fun with that. Day four is going to be another fun day. So on day four, you will create some little thumbnails. So what, so what I would do is probably just start with some little one inch by one inch or even smaller um, squares in my sketchbook. And you can alternate between extreme close-up views and then overlapping designs or patterns. So here we see a close-up view of a flower. You see those petals of the flower totally going off the page. Just brought to mind, of course, Georgia O'Keeffe, who does this um, to a masterful level. Uh, then, gosh, thinking of Georgia O'Keeffe, and then I look at these itty bitty little flowers here, so the exact opposite. <laughs> so we have little cartoon flowers here overlapping each other. And the next one, another close-up flower. Here we just have overlapping little um, fun shapes and designs, sort of like we did in our very first week, I guess it was, with line. So it could be something real that you're looking at that you create an overlapping pattern. Maybe you notice um, on your table you have overlapping objects that you can draw, or it could be something pure fun design. Um, so up to you how you want to interpret the alternating extreme close-up and overlapping um, images. And then finally, this one's going to be the biggest challenge, but I believe in you guys. So ah. <laughs> I'm going to zoom in so you can really see this. This is the one that I'd like you to focus on. So I wanted something that is um, a cool composition and approachable, but also a little bit of a challenge. So when we think linear perspective, probably a lot of us think back to real road tracks um, appearing to converge uh, on the horizon line. This is even easier because our little figure here is going to be covering up the end of that. And he's sort of a man or who knows, some person walking toward the light at the end of the tunnel. A lot of our different art elements are coming together here. So we see value. The brightest bright is really emphasized by um, being at the center of the, the page where the man is walking toward. Uh, subtle gradations getting lighter or darker and darker um, as it gets closer to us in the foreground. Uh, and of course, the linear perspective of the tires. If you're really up for a challenge, then you could do something more like this. So this is the opposite. This is a man with a torch. So he um, is going from a brightly lit area walking toward a darkly lit area, the exact opposite of what we just saw. So again, we see the value scale and completely backwards now. We're going toward the darkest dark. Um, we also see the linear perspective. So if you look at the uh, area that he's in, it's almost like he's inside of a cube. Uh, we see that square, we see the forms um, going from a vanishing point, which would be right smack in the middle of the page, coming out, and the beams at the top of that uh, roof get closer together, they appear smaller the farther away they are, so 
there we see all those different types of space we discussed um, happening. And you can have fun creating your character however you, you'd like if you decide to take on that challenge. Any questions about the homework here? Good. Good to go? Yep. Excellent. Yep, yep, yep. It's gonna Very be good. Nice. Good lecture, thank you. Oh, my Good pleasure. Lectures. Oh, I had a lot wow. of fun putting this one together. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, get a little drawing in. We're gonna keep it super simple tonight. And you are welcome to either uh, draw along with me um, or choose an object around you. We're gonna be drawing a negative space object. So this is the object I have that I'll be looking at. Um, and so, I will be drawing almost the silhouette or just the outline of this pot. I'm not gonna draw any details, any texture, any shading, um, just the space that I see around the object. Uh, and really what this is about, it's, it's a very subtle thing and it's kind of strange to draw negative space sometimes because some people, would just draw the same way that you would normally draw and say, oh, okay, well, I'm just drawing the teapot. But you're not drawing the teapot. You're drawing the space around the teapot. So this is more in the way that you focus on what you're drawing um, than it is about the, the way that the drawing will look at the end of the drawing. So someone who looks at your drawing isn't going to know the difference between if you were focused on negative space or if you were fo focused on positive space. But you will feel the difference as you're drawing um, by just seeing how it feels in your brain. So actually, now that I'm thinking about this, I think perhaps I can do like that. Would y'all like to draw that along oh, with me? we can all draw it with you, yeah. Okay, we'll see how this works. The nose is, the nose is out of the, uh, yeah, keep coming. Nose is out of the frame. Yeah. Cool. All right. So you're welcome to draw along with me, or if there's wow. something around you, go for it. I'm going to um, go for about five minutes. We'll see how far we get. I love the dots on your tablecloth. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great from San Miguel. Okay. So you're welcome to draw from this view or draw whatever you see around you. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And my view of this is gonna be different than yours. So uh, just do your best and we'll see what we end up with. This is like contour drawing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it really is. And so for those of you who weren't with us the past couple months, we um, did nine weeks with Nicolaides, uh, which is in the courses section. If you're ever interested, you can check out some of those techniques. Is this a five minute drawing? I didn't hear what the time was. I set the alarm for five minutes, but we'll see. I have a feeling I'm not going to take five minutes on this, but if you need it. No, we're such you. pros. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where's the teapot? And one thing that I'm doing okay. is. Uh, a lot of comparison. I'm constantly thinking, okay, well, I'm at the top of this teapot, but what is this funny little shape? What's the space um, that I'm seeing between the uh, tip of the, the spout and the handle? By looking at that shape of that empty air in between these two areas, it'll help me draw them more accurately.
So we're about two and a half minutes in. Still got a couple more minutes. Still it over. You switched to Diane from the teapot. Oh, okay. I have, I, I, it disappears on me. There you go. Sorry, I didn't realize I had that setting on. Thanks for letting me know. I'm uh, loving the questions y'all gave because now I have different things I want to try. So I'm going to draw one of these where I don't draw the outline and I just come in and try and uh, do what I'm doing now, which is doing the dark background. I think I'm going to try it once that way. That was something Judith asked about. And now I'm really interested in Naomi's new technique with the subtractive drawing where I like the erasing. It sounds like it does yeah. the job. Oh. It, sounds like it really mm -hmm. does the job. It will. I've done that in the past in figure drawing classes. It's a popular technique. Oh, how fun. And then, of course, the usual way that I'm doing right now. I'll tell you the angle that you choose for your negative space um, will be important because this teapot looks very strange from this angle. Oh, sure. But really cool from y'all's angle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do another one in the corner. You have one minute left exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm going to do the one in the corner myself. Last few seconds. <clears throat> that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and that is five minutes. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> so just a pop up. This was my version. So you can see the difference between having a very like uh, from the angle I was at, I, I didn't see this very key point of the um, teapot, which is the handle. I think that really lets you know this is a teapot. So instead it looks like some kind of strange blob or a chicken or something, but that was what I saw, so I drew it. Anybody else wanna show off your drawing? Let me get Naomi up here and then I'll get you next, Diane. Very nice. Oh, wow. You. Nailed it. Wow, Naomi. Yeah. Beautiful. Did you erase it? No, I didn't. <laughs> I will, though, and I hope I'll do one. Oh, cool. So oh, so the only complaint I have there, Diane, is the line that you drew for the top of the lid. So that is not negative space. That's the details of the positive space object. So we have to pretend like we're, we don't see any of that. We don't. It's just right, right, right. emptiness, but. But you're on the right track, for sure. Oh, Judith, thank you. Let me pop you up here. Or I'm looking at Judy um, oh, okay. first, and then Judith. Oh. Lovely. Yeah, very wow, nice. Wow, let me see. Let me see. Hold it up again. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah you really whoa, nailed it with the handle. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Again, nice. just that warning. Yeah. So yeah. be a purist about the negative space. You wouldn't draw the lid of the um of the thank you this thing so i think you have to start smaller i think if you start big like we used to the little the, the thumbnail you have to thumbnail it the thumbnails so are handy. scratching yeah well, it's see. a lot of scratching <laughs> judith show us what you got oh great hey wow. Ooh, 
Wow, you mm -hmm. did a lot. <laughs> it's a tape so dispenser. The, the bottom one is Naomi's approach of uh, erasing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The middle one and the top ones are uh, the traditional approach. Awesome. Uh, man, you're fast. You already got halfway through. No, well, I had already done the teapot and the, and the chair while you were talking. Oh, very cool. <laughs> Linda, did you get a chance to do some? Yeah, um, I did. Um, <gasps> Whoa. Oh, great. I decided, oh, let's see. It goes this way. Like yeah, it? great. Like I, I decided that when I'm doing these drawing things, I'm going to try to do the pan pastels. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. To well, just practice with them more. And, um, well, and bravo like, for the saturation. I know sometimes yeah. with those, it's hard to get that dark, dark, but you did a great job. Well, um, I see what you mean about when you focus on the negative space, how your brain suddenly gets like <laughs> convoluted or something. Is that what you were talking about when you yes. focus on <laughs> the negative space rather than the positive space? It was like, my mind was all jumbled up or something. Yeah, it's because we've never, ever been taught to see that way before. We're always focused on the positive space. And actually, I had an incredible um, teacher in college who talked about how that's actually a survival mechanism that our brain learned. Because imagine if you are out on the tundra or in the savanna and it's a big, blank, negative space. And then all of a sudden, you see this object running towards you. And if you're not focused on the positive space, then you wouldn't recognize it's a cheetah or it's a bear like attacking me. You know, we've got to focus on the positive space in order to survive. So in our visual field, we've created an importance on the subjects and the objects um, to survive. Ooh. So that's one of those things. Okay. Well, it's the end of class and it's time for my big announcement. I'm so excited. Oh, before, oh. before you announce, before you announce, can I share something? Real oh, quick? please, Naomi. Oh, you said something about uh, when you talk about perception, and then mm -hmm. you said about drawing a person in a building. And all of a sudden, you realize that the person is really big for the building. Well, uh, transition with Kinder last year, they were supposed to draw their bodies, and uh huh, me, and the the legs didn't fit, so I drew them on the side. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is so oh, cute. Friend. I gave it to the mom because I thought it was too funny, but yeah, the legs, she put them on the side because it didn't fit on the bottom. Anyway. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Love it. That's a chuckle. That. Anyway, ready for the news? Okay. So, I don't even know exactly how this happened. One funny synchronicity after the other, but one of my personal heroes as an art teacher is the author of a book that I've recommended, I'm sure, to all of you in the past. Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by yes. Edwards. And guess who I have a phone date with to do an interview? Betty Edwards. Oh my God. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Oh my gosh. Okay. Interview for, what's the interview for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm actually, um, this is launching next week, but I am the art curator for the San Miguel Sunday uh, online magazine. So that's just um, one way that I'm going to be sharing this interview, but I'll also, of course, be putting it on our website. Um, it's going to be an audio conversation because we'll be talking on the phone for an hour or two. So I wanted to know if y'all had any questions that you had for me to ask her about drawing. Yes, Diane. I have. A, uh, when you said it, all, all that came to me immediately was a weekly thing with her you know, like what's a, what's a hand when you're drawing with your left hand, like with an assignment attached to it, not just an expose, but a, um, this is what she said. And here's, how, you know, here's what you need to do to do it, you know, paper and pencil. And yeah. I love that. So, um, so when I'm talking to her, I'll definitely be looking for actual practical hands-on exercises we can do. And then, Bring that back well, to Well, no, you class. go to your people in San Miguel, too. I was thinking for the article. Yeah. If I were reading about Betty Edwards, I would like to, you know, you might show one of her, <clears throat> you know, one of her, her pieces. drawings. Yeah. yeah. And, and maybe come up with an assignment.
playing with that like a, what it really came to me was the coloring contest uh -huh. newspaper. <laughs> that was what really occurred Ooh. <laughs> now is your magazine a uh print or audio all um online so it's oh. yeah it's an online magazine it does um a lot of people are subscribed to the newsletter uh so it would come like in an email form i will take some time to um when it comes out which will be next week i'll be sure and post uh and not not the Betty Edwards interview. I'll I'll be speaking to her on August thirtieth. Um, I think the San Miguel Sundays art section is going to launch that weekend. If you're interested in seeing um, what the online magazine looks like right now, it is live at www.sanmiguelsunday.com, but it doesn't have an art section. It's just a bunch of um, articles, mostly about San Miguel type of stuff. Uh, but we're gonna be working on an art section that is particularly all about interviewing artists, um, talking about the creative process, art galleries in, in San Miguel, and all that good kind of stuff. Uh, so excited. It's San Miguel Sunday, all one word? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Judith will come up with a question. Awesome, yeah, if y'all think of anything, y'all just post it in the group. I'm gonna be asking her about that and to me, it's really a paradigm shift. I know I've seen it in lots of my students, and I, I know I've been using um, Betty Edwards' techniques to, to reach students in that moment of seeing the world differently. Like, how, what is that mode of seeing as an artist where you go from seeing the three-dimensional world to the ability to put it on a flat 2D piece of paper? So I'm still coming up with questions I just confirmed with her earlier today. So it's all new. That's so exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm meeting my hero, <laughs> heroine. Um, so I was excited to get to share the news with you guys today. What did, what did her work look like before she discovered this? That would be my question. Ooh, good one. Oh, that's excellent. Is that, I mean, whatever she did swapped her out of wherever she was. Mm-hmm. I would like to know what what's most difficult for her still. Cool, good questions. And is there a volume too? <laughs> there is. You know, she's actually published a handful of books. Um, so, drawing on the right side of the brain was the first, and she has a book all about color. She has a uh, color mixing in oil. She's got several so yeah, okay. um i think what i'm gonna do is spend the week researching more about her life and her uh different publications so that when i do talk to her i'm not asking super obvious things but um yeah. but she's is uh, obvious yeah but she seems like a really friendly wonderful um person and was very uh generous with her time so I'll be telling her about our group. Maybe we'll be lucky and she'll come and join us every week. <laughs> I guess. Oh, I maybe one. Maybe one. Yeah, maybe once. It would be a little intimidating to have yeah, the woman who changed sure. art instruction <laughs> on our call every time. I wouldn't be able to teach her. Just say, Betty, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> so thanks for sharing my good news with me. I'm so That's excited great. and I'll be... Um, yeah, looking forward. If y'all think of any other questions, just post them in the group. And thank you all. I hope y'all have a lot of fun this week with Drawing with Space. Did you send oh. us the uh, homework assignment already? I didn't see it. I did post it in oh. the group. Um, okay. So it should be it should be up there for you. Grazie molti. Bye. Gracias, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a great week. Bye. Buenas noches. Gracias.